Hi everyone, welcome to uh, another episode of the Teacher's Point of View. I I'm actually buzzing about getting uh, Mr. James Pope on, on this episode because I, I kind of uh, went to a meeting, I don't know how I ended up getting in, but it was a meeting with Heads Up for HT and um, I, and actually got to, got a ch opportunity to hear what James had to say, Alison Creel, Colin Goffin and, and kind of a mixture of, of different head teachers as well in different places of, of where their schools are and um, kind of hearing the journey that you're on, James, I mean, I'm not going to like spoil it for you. Do you mind kind of just explaining expressing kind of where you've been and kind of the journey you're on now yeah absolutely tj thank you and thank you for having me on the podcast um so yeah james pope um formerly a secondary school head teacher i've been in education for 20 plus years uh been in leadership and education for sort of 15 plus years um and uh, became a secondary head teacher in 2014 uh, I've been a secondary head teacher. I've been uh, exec head in a primary school as well within a trust. Um, sort of, I suppose, uh, famously or infamously uh, had a television series sort of made about the school, which was actually was made about the trust, but my school featured within that. Uh, and that was that sort of went out for recording. And I suppose uh, the infamous bit is the, is the fact that I resigned after four years of leading that school community uh, and that resignation was caught on television. Um, but sort of left left headship really um, for a whole sort of a whole range of reasons. Um, but I suppose specifically because I just felt this sort of values gap between you know what I'd wanted to do as a head teacher and what the system was increasingly asking and demanding of me to do as a head teacher. Um, and you know that that sort of values gap um, I, I found ultimately sort of dissatisfying. Um, and sort of left to create um, Inspire Educate, which is which is my organisation, uh, and the aim was to sort of identify a network, a, a national network of head teachers who, who probably felt the same way that I did. That perhaps the um, you know the leader that they set out to be wasn't the leader that they were necessarily being at that moment in time because of all of those demands that come with being ahead. So uh, set that up a couple of years ago. Out of that was born our uh, Heads Up for Head Teachers campaign. Um, and that was predominantly um, initially it was about providing support to head teachers who, like me, had sort of um, left the system or were being squeezed out of the system, you know, sort of skilled, experienced, wise leaders um, who were who sort of reached out to me after the TV programme came out um, and sort of, you know, sort of identified with the journey that I'd been on um, uh, and sort of and there were a lot of them. I mean, ultimately, I was quite surprised there were a lot of them. Um, and I wanted to sort of give something back. Um, I wanted to provide those head teachers with support, uh, you know, whether they were still in the system or they're out of the system, um, find some way of providing them with some support. And that's where Heads Up came from initially, was this notion that actually there are too many head teachers um, you know, who are leaving the system and we can't afford for that to happen. You know, we know that sort of retention and recruitment in education is a problem. We know it's specifically a problem for head teachers. We know that it's, as Vic Goddard would say, it's the best job in the world. We know that it's, a, it's an awesome job to be a head teacher, but we also know that it comes with a very specific set of pressures and stresses and demands. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we're looking to do with Heads Up is to provide better support for head teachers to keep them in the job um, so that they can be the leader that they set out to be, but they can be the best version of themselves as well. And that's, you know, that's the, that's the, where it started, really. And that's that's where the Heads Up journey started. Um, yeah, that's, that's Heads Up. That's, my, my, that's a very rapid overview of my journey to, uh, to where I am now, TJ. I mean, that's probably one of the quickest summaries I've ever I've, I've... <laughs> in this podcast to be fair but I mean it's amazing what you guys are doing in terms of um, heads up for head teachers isn't it because like uh, I think for, for for far too long I mean we, we've kind of like been in a system in a system where it's it's very regimented in the way that we, we kind of pro like uh, sort of get, get our children going you know I mean like it, it should be I mean you, you, one of the questions that you ask and you did ask in that meeting is is whether education is fit for purpose I mean, what, like, what, what, I mean, why specifically that question? Um, because I think, I think the world has changed. You know, the reality is we, you know, not just because of COVID, you know, the, the world is evolving and changing around us all of the time. And, you know, I'm, I'm always really clear. Um, and one of the things that we do with Heads Up is we actually celebrate education in its current form because there's too much knocking of it. You know, there is a huge amount of great work that goes on 
every single minute of every single day in our schools up and down this country. And it's brilliant, you know, and it's it's getting back to the heart of what education is, sort of fundamentally what is it. And we talk a lot with the head teachers in the Heads Up Network, you know, about their inspirational moments and their positive moments. And actually, you know, we describe education as being this sort of complex um, web of, of interactions between children and children and children and staff. And so much of that is brilliant. If you think, if you just think of the scale of it that's happening every single day, even in the online world that we're operating at the moment, it's absolutely awesome. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not sort of very much in favour of the kind of the, you know, the reformation agenda, the fact that education's broken and we need to fix it, um, because I think, I think that's the wrong way of looking at it. I think there's a, there's a load of great work that happens in education every single day. However, can it be different? And should it be different to reflect the changing world in which we're living in? Yes, I think it can. And I think we should be thinking about, you know, how we can, how we can ensure that education uh, in, in its entirety evolves and changes uh, and transforms itself. You know, you sort of think, what will the world be like? I'm often asking, what will the world be like in 10 years' time? What's it going to be like in 2030? Yeah. What's the world going to be like for our young people in 2030? My son's in in as a five-year-old he's in year one he's had you know the first year and a half of his education has been massively disruptive i've got a daughter who's in year 11 her education has been massively disrupted mm. and i think my biggest fear slash hope for education is that by the time bertie spans the 10 years between where he is and where his sister is that things are genuinely transformatively different for mm. him you know, in his experience of what he's doing when he's in year 11. That's my hope. My fear is that it's not. And I kind of think, you know, if you think, if, we, if anybody sits down and thinks, oh, I wonder what the world will be like in 10 years' time. We, we can't, we probably can't come up with sort of specific things that we think might be different in the world. But one thing we can say is it will probably be different. And, and you know, I think the, the key is that we make sure that we're, we're doing the things now in our schools and we're, and we're sort of visionary leaders as head teachers of our schools so that we can make sure that when we do get there, they have moved on and they have changed. I say not because they're broken or not working at the moment. Our schools are brilliant. I think it's some of the things that sit around them that don't work, um, but actually so that we can, we can genuinely and fundamentally offer our young people you know, a broader definition of what it means to be successful, a broader definition uh, of what it means to, you know, go through your school life journey as a, as a young person and enjoy it. You know, yeah. ultimately, we need to remember that um, I get I get sort of frustrated that we we take this massively reductive approach for our young people and and we define the sum total of the first 16 years of their life with 10 numbers on an A4 piece of paper. <laughs> you know, and you kind of think, actually, that, that, that doesn't even begin to sum it up. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and it's, it's that broader concept of, you know, our young people enjoying school, loving being at school, loving learning, mm. you know, for what it is and the outcomes coming separately to that. So, yeah, it's a sort of transformative, it's a, it's a transformative view of, of, of the education system. And I, I really, I, you know, one of the things, um, you know, that we, we talked about in that session, but we, we mentioned, you and I mentioned earlier on, you know, is I think, I think we have to change the rhetoric around it. There's so much negativity you know, projected onto education from all sorts of different quarters. And yet there is so much great work going on. You know, the support staff in our schools are brilliant. The teaching staff in our schools are brilliant. The leaders in our schools are brilliant. Our schools and the way they interact with their communities are brilliant. And of course, there's things that we'd want to improve and there are things that we want to develop. Um, but I think we need to spend more time appreciatively inquiring what is working really, really well and less time spending all of our time knocking it yeah i agree i mean educate like what the the, the the stuff that teachers and and school staff and support staff and even the communities within schools in some respects are, like they do a phenomenal job i mean you're talking about hundreds and thousands of kids of lives in, in each school right i mean these the future of these kids depends on what happens at schools and i'm not knocking anything teachers do and or school staff do i mean that's not and again i just want to reiterate your point i mean it's it's not about discrediting the the, the profession but i think ultimately what we've got to be looking at is is if, if it's fit for purpose now i read an article the other day and it said by within the next 10 to 20 years 70 percent of the jobs we do now are going to be automated so where does that leave our future generation our future workforce 
And our, our, what our problem is at the moment, in my opinion, and this is me looking from the outside, is we are still very much using a system. I know, I know we've got interactive whiteboards, but I mean, and, and we're no longer, we, we don't have any blackboards, but we're still using a, a system that is very similar to what it was 50 to 100 years ago. And back then, jobs that were available were accounting jobs, like teaching jobs, doctor jobs, you know, like, I mean, the, the jobs that you needed qualifications for. Nowadays, I mean, there's so many different industries out there and so many different independents and so many people want to become self-employed and have work-life balance and actually be like technologically advanced. I mean, with that, our current curriculum isn't actually resembling the 21st century. I mean, how do we kind of move in that direction? Well, I think, you know, I think the, the, the danger, I think, sometimes with this with, with this sort of discussion around the curriculum is it always ends up being polarised into sort of knowledge or skills. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I think that's, you know, that the, there are views on either that you get views from, from different camps um, about about what the curriculum should be delivering. But, you know, the reality is and has always been that actually it's a mix of both of those things. Mm. And it's a complex mix of both of those things. Um, but I think it's about, you know, it's about spending time um, as, as leaders within the system thinking about actually, you know, what does my community need? What does it need now? And what does it what is it going to need in 10 years time? Um, you know, what does what do the local businesses need? What do the national businesses need? And I think it's about building a curriculum from that starting point so that we're giving we're giving a, a broader view of the skills, qualities and knowledge that young people need to be successful. Um, so I think it's it's about not not necessarily an argument around knowledge and, and or skills. I think it's it's more about um you know the, the complexity of it and the richness of it and the breadth of it um which will which i think will address what you're saying so this notion about preparing children we've always had that you know i remember i remember but this is a while ago now it doesn't feel like a while ago but you know sort of back in 2000 2003 2004 you know there was a there was a video clip called shift happens and i think there have been iterations of it since then you know, but it was describing it was the emerging sort of Google world and Facebook was emerging at that time. And it was describing the world in which we were preparing children for. And that can be a really difficult concept to get our heads around, actually, because we don't know what it's actually going to be like. We yeah. know it will be different, but we don't know what the specifics are. But actually, if we all we need to really do is accept the first bit. We know it's going to be different. Um, and we know that the job market is going to be different. We know it's going to change significantly away from what it's been in the past. So actually, how can we how can we best prepare children for the unknown? That's an uncomfortable, you know, that's an uncomfortable thing to plan for. And and therefore I get why we sometimes, you know, we re we retreat back into what we are comfortable about. So we retreat back and where we can teach them this knowledge because we're comfortable with that. Uh, you know, we can have a we can have a curriculum and an assessment system which is very much focused on knowledge and assessing knowledge because that's comfortable and we know what we're doing in that arena. Um, but I think we have to be braver than that. I think we have to be bolder than that and accept that actually maybe there are some parts about what we do in the education system and through the curriculum that are more difficult to assess. And that's not a problem as long as we're confident as leaders when those children leave, they are prepared for whatever it is that the next steps are going to be for them. Um, and, and, you know, that's about a richness then of experience. It's about... It's about interaction with the local community and the national community and businesses. And it's about talking to them about what, you know, what do you think children need or what do you think young people need? Um, you know, so it's, it's I, I, I get it's a really difficult thing to do, but I don't think we should shy away from it because it's a difficult thing to do. Um, but I think what we should be doing more of and what I love about your podcast is it, is it in part does it, is we should be speaking to the people in schools who have the expertise and the experience uh, and we should be building it from from grassroots level up rather than the system that we currently have, which is a sort of almost endless reaction to, you know, what the, the latest bit of guidance from the DfE or, you know, the latest Ofsted framework and sort of bending the whole of our education system to fit that. Yeah. Um, I think that's the difference is about it's about leadership from our schools and our head teachers um, and, and within that, you then get a sort of a really passionate reconnection to people's values and why they became a leader in the first place. Because it isn't about SATs results or GCSE results. That's not why you become a head teacher. You know, to oh well, I'm, you know, I'm a head because I want to improve the GCSE results from seventy percent to eighty percent. You know, nobody says that. You know, you become a head teacher because you want to lead 
a rich learning community and you want to give the, be- the children the best education that you possibly can. So let's make that happen. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, like, why do educators get into teaching in the first place? It's to make a difference to these kids' lives, isn't it? And I think some, in, in some form or another, the system almost kind of takes you away from that in, in some respects, because... Ultimately, what, what are life skills? I mean, those like when I, as an employer, when I when I have somebody come in to look, uh, come in to interview for my company, I am looking at people that want to a have done the research, they they know how to apply that knowledge, not not just put it in an exam, but it's about actually applying that knowledge to why they're applying for the job, right? And then it's the key eye contact, the confidence, the interpersonal skills. Are they going to challenge ideas? Be innovative, like you know, like be able to collaborate and actually take criticism and not kind of answer back and be professional in the way that you act. I mean. That, that's not demonstrated in an exam, you know? And, and I'm not yeah. saying that there isn't a place for an exam. I mean, I think it's important to learn knowledge, but it shouldn't be the destination. It should be part of the journey and it should be the fuel for the journey in some respects to help you achieve what you what are capable of achieving. You know, I mean, it's far easier. And it's something Alison said on the podcast earlier this week, but it's something that's really important is um, kind of like, it's far easier to build on success and replicate success than it is to actually get a child to be motivated from failure. You know, like, because if they don't know that they can do something, then it's harder to motivate them. And, and like, it's harder for them to find their passion in it. But when they're actually passionate about something, actually, well, you know, I mean, it's, it's easier to replicate, isn't it? Yeah, completely. And, and, and like everything, it's all about balance, you know, so it's about, um, you know, and I think sometimes there's a, there's a view of where schools have tried to do it differently that, you know, it, 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 you're taking a softer approach and therefore you can't deliver on the outcomes. You know, I get, I get the absolute joy of working with schools up and down this country on a, on a daily basis who, who are proving otherwise, you know, that you can have this sort of you know, the, the starting point for your curriculum can be something other than the assessment at the end um, and, the, and the way that you build your curriculum. And, and therefore, your, your view of what success is, you know, which, is, which was Alice, both Alison and Colin's point on, on the Heads Up, um, on the Heads Up event, you know, was around actually, let's, let's look at what our children want to be successful in and then help them to be successful in that. And I've, you know, examples of curricula that are built on the notion of you know, what's the, what's the change that you want to see in the world? You know, what's the, what's the complex problem that you want to try and solve as a young person? Mm. Yeah, that's a great starting point for a curriculum, you know, and, and enabling children. The, the challenge is then making sure that we are ticking all of the right bits of the, the curriculum in its basic form. But actually, that challenge is not insurmountable. And lots of schools have demonstrated that they can do it, that you can still cross-reference it to the knowledge elements of the curriculum that need to be covered. You know, and in primary, the sort of, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the very early sort of skills that need to develop around literacy and numeracy, you can make sure that those things are happening as well. So it's about, it's about saying we can do this and this rather than this sort of reductive the, the pressure to deliver sort of reductive curriculum where it's, you know, we are just literally preparing children for assessments seemingly endlessly. Um, you know, we, we can have both children who are successful in assessment because we've made them successful more broadly rather than children who are just as successful in assessment. Um, and, and I think, you know, it takes, it takes some big thinking to do that at a system level. Um, but in a school at a school level, you know, you know, I don't think we've, I don't think we've said anything in the last 10 minutes that the greater majority of teachers, school leaders and, and support staff who work in schools would say, yeah, that's what we want as well. Mm. Um, you know, so it is what the system it's what the system in terms of the profession. It's what we want to do. That's where the that's where the passion lies. And that's where the nourishment for individuals lies. Um, and in occupying that space, what's interesting is you also then start to get into the realms of well-being. You know, yeah. people who are inspired and passionate and nourished in the work that they're doing have a much greater sense of well-being. So we also have a, a, a profession that feels better about the work that it's doing. Um, so, you know, all, all of those things, I think, are, are possible and achievable. I'm not saying it's easy. It's got significant challenges. Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, which is why for me... Um, you know, we we focus on providing that nourishment and that well-being and that support to head teachers because ultimately they will be the agents of change within the system that are going to make it happen. Um, you know, so we want to work with head teachers who 
who, you know, that's what they want to do. And we want to help them to be that leader. You know, our vision statement is be the leader that you set out to be. Um, and that's, you know, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's fantastic to be honest with you. I mean, I think like even myself, I mean, when, when I'm, when I'm passionate about something, I go the extra mile and it doesn't feel like work. That's when I feel alive. If, if anything, you know, like when I feel like I'm making a difference, I mean, and, and, and teachers for teachers, it's those light bulb moments that you see in children that make the job worthwhile. I mean, you don't do it for the money. So, I mean, if you're no longer getting those light bulb moments in your children, I mean, you've got to reevaluate re why you've become a teacher. And if it's not the same principles, then ultimately we need, we need a systemic change, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, I'm always really, I'm always really conscious of, um, yeah, and you said this earlier on, but actually the, the, the reality is that that does happen. It happens every single day. You know, those light bulb moments happen every single day. Um, but there are other light bulb moments that could be happening as well. There could there are other light bulb moments that could be happening for the children for whom it's not happening. Um, so it's not it's it's always really difficult to present this stuff without it sounding like a criticism. I, I, I genuinely I've I've got the the absolute utmost respect for everybody who works in our education system. I think some of the issues systemically that we want to change, ironically, I've got nothing to do with the education system and the schools and the staff that work in them. It's those things that are happening outside of their schools. You know, it's the agendas that are being pushed outside of their schools, um, you know, at, at a media level, at a government level, at an Ofsted level. You know, the, the things that should be there to help this happen, it is the Department for Education. You wouldn't <laughs> always think it was. You'd sometimes think it's the Department against Education. Um, you know, but it's supposed to be the Department for Education. And it's about, you know, I just don't think there is enough all of those things outside end up becoming a distraction. They end up becoming the thing that you end up working towards, um, which distracts you away from the sort of vision and mission and strategy that you're trying to get right in your school. Absolutely. And that's certainly, you know, that's very much how I felt, you know, that my school essentially got overtaken by a, um, you know, a short termism view of education, you know, presented through Ofsted and an Ofsted inspection, you know, that completely missed the point about the longer term journey that we were, we were on and the, and the you know the different way in which we were trying to deliver that broader notion of success for the for the young people within our school community, um, you know, and that happens all, all too often. So where we do get, um, you know, where we do get something different, and we where we do get something inspirational and innovative, um, we've got a, we've got a, an accountability system that tends to squash it yeah. uh, and and stop it ever getting off the ground. You know, that seems bonkers to me. You know, Ofsted, Ofsted, I've got a role to play. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not in the camp that says accountability is really important in education. I, so, yeah. I just don't think we've got it right. Um, and what it should, what it certainly shouldn't be doing is holding education back from evolving. And at the moment, it really feels as if it is doing exactly that. It's yeah. stopping education from evolving. It's stopping innovation. It's stopping things from being different. Um, so I think we just have to take, a, you know, part of it, I think, is about timelines. And we just have to take a, a longer term view of what's happening for our young people in schools. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, like it's, it's well, we've got to come in numbers, haven't we? Because for far too long, it's kind of been a dictatorship from politicians and, and DFE. But the problem is they're, they're not necessarily the ones that are in schools and that know their community, that know their children and they, they know how to teach. You know, So, I mean, like it's, it's like going up to a, a brain surgeon and telling them how to do brain surgery. And, and, and just because I've got stitches in my leg, I mean, it doesn't like, it doesn't work that way. So what do we need to do? We, we need to kind of make sure we've got the numbers and start having these conversations in some respects it's got to come from the ground up like you said you know i mean got, like colin goffin said in that meeting he goes uh, they might have the guns but we've got the numbers so and, and, yeah. and ultimately like you only have to see that in what happened with the unions last week to overturn the decision that was made so it shows it can work so i mean like how do we get everyone together and actually i mean people might not agree with everything everyone is saying which is absolutely fine but only by challenging each other on ideas are we going to actually come up with better ideas right yeah, and I, and I kind of think, you know, we, we thought long and hard of this with Heads Up because, you know, we're a, we're a sort of broad church of, of, of head teachers. Um, and, and, you know, I think sometimes we spend too long, we tend too long sort of discussing the what. Mm. Uh, and actually what, you know, I, I think where we can find real common ground is in the why and the how. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, the how will start to divide us and we'll have different ways of going about it. And the what we want it to look like will be different. And, and you know what? Part of me thinks that's absolutely fine. 
as long as you are delivering really high quality education and learning for your young people, there are lots of different ways of doing it. But, you know, sometimes we're sort of held very much in this what space, um, you know, and the point about the DfE is, is really well made. You know, they've demonstrated repeatedly through the last 10 months that they don't fundamentally know how schools work on the ground. You know, so that a lot of the guidance just ignores uh, or doesn't even take into account how schools actually operate. So, we, you know, we have to stop. We use this, I use this phrase a lot in my work with Heads Up, but also with whole education. Uh, and others have used it before me. It's not an original phrase, but we need to stop looking up for people to change it for us. And we need to change it. And a part of the, you know, I part of the mission of Heads Up, um, you know, beyond the support is that we provide a space where people can come together and they can talk about the why and the how, and they can reconnect with their values because that's where we can find common ground. Mm-hmm. You know, of all of the, the several hundred head teachers are in our network, in fact, the, the, the couple of thousand of head teachers are in our network, they won't all agree on, you know, what their curriculum should look like or what teaching and learning should look like. And, and neither should they, as long as they're confident in what they're doing and it's coming from a, a place of values and it's coming from, you know, it's starting with ethics and it's thinking about what is the right thing to do for our young people. Uh, and what is therefore the right education to deliver. So, you know, we can find common ground in the why and the how, and if we can congregate around that, then yeah, I completely agree. We can then have a significant voice about what is and isn't happening in our education system. You know, I, I think one of the, I was having this conversation earlier on with somebody else, but, you know, one of the paradoxes in education is, you know, we've, we've got an accountability system that insists that everything should, you know, if your school needs to improve or develop, it should happen within the space of about six weeks. And if it hasn't, you know, they're going to come and tell you off and we're going to, we're going to hold you account for the fact that you've not transformed. Why have you not transformed this community in six weeks time? And yet as educationalists and school, you know, as, as support staff and teachers and leaders, we know that the most significant driver for organisational shifts in the education system is the culture. And you can't change a culture overnight. It takes time. Um, and that's not to say that we should allow underperformance to happen during that period of time. I'm not saying that for a second. But actually, what we need to think about, first of all, we need to ask, is it underperformance or are we measuring the wrong thing? And secondly, you know, if once, we, once you've answered that question, you then start to go, OK, well, maybe it's not underperformance. Maybe the performance is just not where we want it to be and we would like it to improve. But we accept that that's therefore going to take time. Um, but there are so many external, um, you know, kind of pitfalls that you can fall into. You know, don't even get me started on the assessment system, you know, which, which basically is, is, a, is a riddle for, for the education system to solve but will hold the vast majority of perceived underperforming schools will remain underperforming schools forevermore because of the way that our assessment system is structured. So actually those schools could be making really rapid progress with their young people and they could be really improving things for those young people, but you'd never know it in the data set. Um, So, you know, there are all of these external complexities. I think what we, what we try to do is bring head teachers together and hold them in the space of you're doing a great job. You are really, really good at what you do. Let's do more of it and let's seize the agenda back. Let's take the agenda back for our profession about what we want our schools to look like. Yeah. Because we're skilled, we're experienced, we're wise and we're passionate and we're doing it for the right reasons. And I think, you know, I don't hardly know anybody who can't get behind that agenda. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the big problem in the UK in terms of education is that we we massively operate in fear. You know, like whether it be fear from offset or whether it be from teachers, like kind of fearing from the head teachers. I mean, and then then obviously the kids, like they fear not passing exams. You know, I mean, this is this whole like system is embedded with fear. I mean, we need to take that out, don't we? I mean, it almost feels like from an outside perspective. Your teachers' wall, like your teachers' backs, are always against the wall, and it's almost like we've got to find the hammer and smash through that wall and actually open and open like the room, you know? Yeah, and I think it's about you know. So there's a, there's a whole again there's a whole complex range of things that contribute to that. There's the negativity that you get in some sections of the media. There's the there's the negative messages that come out of government. There's the, you know, the very high stakes accountability system that sort of, you know, just leaves this sword of Damocles hanging right over the education system. So you've got, you know, you've got, you've got those things there, but, you know, it's about, 
you know, I think we need to stop apologising for our for what we do. Mm. You know, there's a, there, I think there is an element of that where we're sort of apologetic for, um, you know, being teachers or, or or working in schools or being leaders in schools. Actually, you know, and it, but it comes back. So it comes back to that point about okay, let's celebrate what we are doing. Let's take an appreciative inquiry approach to what we're doing in our schools, and let's celebrate the great work. You know, one of the things that we because that comes, that's really demoralising. So one of the things that we talk about at Heads Up with, with the heads is, you know, I mean, this happens up and down the country every single summer. You know, so head teacher, the school will await the results, whether it's, you know, SATs or whether it's GCSEs or whether it's you, know, you wait for the results to come in. Um, you know, you look at the results and there's either a huge sigh of relief or there's a sort of, you know, fist pumping moment that lasts about 30 seconds. Uh, what do we do immediately? We focus on the things that didn't work. We focus on the things that went wrong. We focus on where it failed and we spend the next 12 months for, rather than focusing on the, the stuff that worked, actually the great results that we got, the young people who did really, really well and thinking about why they did, why did they do really well and how can we help other children to do really, really well as well. So there is a, you know, there is a, a negativity that's taken hold across our system, which starts with those external factors. But I think part of a grassroots movement should be Let's stop apologising, actually. Let's start saying, let's start standing together and saying, do you know what? We do a bloody great job. We do a fantastic job on a daily basis. We do a fantastic job in the longer term. And let's celebrate it and start to be more positive about the work that goes on in our schools, um, you know, which is the vast majority of it is very, very good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's been there's been incredible work in schools over the last like 10 to 12 months and we can't take anything away from the profession. And again, it's nothing down to teachers or schools that we're talking about. What we're talking about is a systemic problem, isn't, aren't we? And I think ultimately, if we're ever going to make a difference, if we're going to make sure that we've got a workforce of the future, we've, we've got to put more emphasis and appreciation within the teaching profession. And I think the only way we're really going to do that is by working together. And again, we've for far too long we've been an individualistic culture and I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that so to speak but in, in a school capacity with, when it's public schools money I mean public money and taxpayers money with these, these kids that go to public schools that come from broken families or deprived areas or have whatever like trauma that they might have experienced growing up I mean we need to be making sure that we are actually catering to these individual children because like 30 percent of children are like are forgotten about every 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 year in terms of when they're when they're 16 and then you've got like the, the, sort of the, sort of between that 30 percent and eight like 85 percent those children in between are like are forgotten about in the respect to they might pass exams but actually what has the exam situation helped in terms of like providing them with a career you know and, and i think like we've got to be better for our kids emotional intelligence is so important in the 21st century i mean there's no point earning a hundred thousand pound a year if if you're going to end up being depressed the whole time so what we yeah. need to teaching our children from the age of like an earlier age, instead of assessing them at the age of four years old, right? I, I mean, that is bonkers that they do that anyway. But instead of these assessments at four years old, what we should be doing is coaching them how to emotionally deal with, with some of the trauma or if you're in, in a traumatic situation, how to deal with it, you know? And, and it's, it's, it's far more relevant to the 21st century. Yeah, I mean, and there's a, you know, there's a couple, of, well, there's several sort of really big points in what you're saying, you know, from, from my point of view. You know, the, the, the one thing is about a, a truly equitable system. And, and, and we are so far from that, um, you know, in, in so many different ways. I mean, you know, just, just financially, it's not equitable. You know, the, the, it's not. The, I mean, one of the things that I think you, there's, there's a lot of public education that needs to go on around education. You made the point earlier on, everybody's been to school. You know, one of our taglines for the for the TV program was, you know, one thing that we, you know, the, the part of the problem is everybody's been to school, so everybody's an expert. Um, you know, I've 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 been in hospital. That doesn't make me a brain surgeon or a, or any other type of surgeon. You know, but we do have this. You know, everybody has that experience of school life, so everybody thinks that they've got, you know, an opinion to offer. And I'm not saying they haven't, but what we need to do is trust our professionals. But one of the interesting things about that is we, you know, we live in a society where we want the best of everything. We want the best public service. We want the best hospitals. We want the best schools. We want the best sort of public services that we can possibly have. We have to pay for it. You know, ultimately we have to pay for it. And we have a funding system in this country for our schools, which is not equitable. Um, it's not fair. 
across the whole country. Um, and it doesn't compare to the private sector in any way, shape or form. You know, so we have to stop. We have to look at our expectations of what schools can reasonably do for the money that we are prepared to give them. And if we want them to do more, then we need them to give more money. We need, sorry, we need to give them more money so that they can do that and they can deliver quality on our behalf. So, you know, that's one part of the, the, the sort of equity. The, the second part of the equity is just the huge regional differences that you get in the amount of money that comes into schools to support the work that those schools do. That needs to be addressed. Um, you know, so the, the, again, there are, some, there are some fundamental things that our school staff are grappling with you know, which, which, you know, at a really basic level, are beyond their control. The system should be sorting that out, and it's not, and it's had the chance to do it. Um, you know, fair funding is what now, for sort of four or five years old, the fair funding formula, it wasn't fair at all. That fair funding formula is not fair. Um, you know, and, and so the opportunity to address it is missed because it's going to involve extra money coming into the system. So, you know, we put all of that on one side and, and come back to the point that you're making. You know, ultimately, we still want to do the best by our young people. We want to do the best by our children. Um, but actually, if we create cultures within our schools, which are exam factories, then our, our children will recognise that for what it is. You know, if you, if you talk to young people, and, you know, we all do, let's face it, uh, one of the things that, you know, I, I find sort of mildly depressing is the conversations that I have with young people. You sort of take them out of the school, as, and again, it's not about criticising schools, but you take them out, they recognise that in their school, that they're, they're kind of just a number. Mm. It's just about, you know, I'm just, I'm here. If I get good results, then that's good for the school. Shouldn't make any, that, that should not be the conversation that we're having with our young people. And that should not be the impression that we are leaving them with, which picks up on your point then, you know, if we've got children who are feeling like that, and I'm talking about children who are at, you know, really good schools, schools that do really well in the system that we've got, schools that get very good outcomes for them. But if our children are recognising that actually what the school needs from them is a really good set of data, then something has gone horribly wrong somewhere in that equation. Um, you know, so that, that again, that approach of, um, you know, just being much broader about how we define success in our schools and what it means for our young people to be successful. You know, that becomes the building block for something much more enriching and nourishing for our young people and will better prepare them for whatever the world looks like when they step out into it. You know, so there's loads of sort of big ideas, um, you know, and I think, and, and again, you know, we want to provide a space where those conversations can be had where head teachers can talk to other head teachers about well, what do you think about this? What do you think should be happening? What are you doing in your school? Actually, you know, what are your, what's your passion for education? Um, and, and I think that's been dampened a little bit in the last 12 years for head teachers. You know, they're sort of not enabled to have those conversations. They're not provided with the space to have that conversation. And actually we want to lift the lid on it again and sort of go, okay, well, come and have that conversation with us and let's, fi let's find out. And let's find out then how we can support each other to do it. And that's where we can get a grassroots movement um, that, you know, so our schools, the staff in our schools, the leaders in our schools, they become the agents for change. And we can then start to push back against some of these, frankly, often slightly ridiculous external sort of complexities that stop us from being the schools that we want to be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was, I was speaking to uh, Simon Smith, obviously the head teacher of, uh, um, uh, sorry, basically he's a head teacher of a primary school sort of up north, right? And uh, he basically, um, Whitby, there you go, East Whitby Primary School. And uh, he basically, uh, he, we were just having a conversation and, and like he was talking about kind of um, some of the children, obviously like it's a, it's a fishing town, isn't it? In some respects. I mean, it's, it's on the North East Coast and um, it, it basically some of these kids come from, from backgrounds where their, their parents are from like maybe fishing families, right? So, uh, and they have a knowledge about that. So when they come into school, actually, they're not allowed to talk about things they already know. And he was like, well, actually, knowledge should be a starting point, not the end goal. And, yeah. and it should be like, I mean, it, you don't like schools know their communities better than everybody else. I mean, they, they know like what's going on. So what would I would love to have seen is that all the head teachers, all the primary head teachers in East Whitby actually are kind of working together and actually saying, look, this, we know our communities, we will hold each other accountable, but it's not going to be in, in a form of judgment, but it's going to be in a supportive capacity because nobody's going to know our kids better than like us, you know, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the direction we need to move in if we're actually going to be able to collaborate and actually be better. Yeah. 
and you know within that then you need to provide you need to provide spaces where collaboration is proper deep collaboration you know it's not a veneer it's not well yeah we kind of collaborate you know and and um you know the, the, the example i always use in the secondary sector you know we, we kind of collaborate until we're all looking for a maths teacher <laughs> and then it's every man from himself you know the collaboration goes out of the window at that point so that we have that proper you know Stephen Tierney promotes this idea as do several others you know of proper regional collective responsibility for the outcomes and the education of all young people you know so we haven't got schools pitted against each other because that's how it feels it feels if they're pitted against each other and we move away from that situation where schools are you know, either intentionally or accidentally competing with each other for the same glory or resources or whatever it might be. Um, you know, I was on a, a presentation last night with the, with the brilliant Johnny Utley from, um, from the Education Alliance, uh, also based up in Yorkshire, actually on, up on the East Coast. Um, you know, and, and he was talking about the, the work that he's done within his trust. Um, you know, one of the things that one of his real you know, I suppose, uh, triggers for him, you know, is, is Ofsted banners outside the school gate, you know, or, or, or banners that are somehow in, in sort of, you know, indicating some kind of competitiveness with other schools just down the road. You know, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. And let's stop doing that because actually we're in control of that agenda. We don't have to do that, um, you know, and then we can get proper collaboration with each other. Um, and that's got to be beneficial. We know we are much better and much stronger when we work together and we collaborate, um, you know, you know, regionally, in trusts, nationally, across networks. It doesn't really matter, you know, how that's structured. Um, but you, we need to find that common ground and we need to find that common desire to, to do things differently for our young people and get better outcomes for them and then create a culture in which we can properly collaborate with each other and we're not competing in the way that sometimes schools do. Absolutely. I mean, it really breaks my heart, James, if I'm honest with you, when like you've got two children that go biking every Saturday together, right? But one is born on one side of the road and the other one's born on the other side of the road. And you've got one kid that goes to an outstanding school and then the other kid goes to a special measure school. And it's absolutely okay. And it happens for years. You know, it keeps happening. And it's like, how, like, how is it acceptable just because where a child is born that goes to a public school that he, he doesn't like he or she doesn't get the same quality education as, as their mate that they, they go biking with on the weekend. You know, I mean, it, I find it, I find it quite ridiculous. And I mean, it's, it's something that we need to move away from because I genuinely believe every child deserves an opportunity like of a good education. It's, we're a first world country, you know? I mean, we should be leading the way. We should lead, be leading by example. But what we're doing is giving preferential treatment in some respects without kind of doing it consciously. And, and it's just not acceptable. But, but a, you know, a, a counter view on that, TJ, I think I, I, would, I would offer a counter view is that, is that um, the lens through which we look at the difference between those two schools... And you know, I think the perception sometimes is that will be miles apart from each other, but we know where that judgment has come from. You know, yeah. we know, we know that it's, it's through, you know, what I think a lot of people perceive to be a flawed system of accountability of very high stakes accountability. And actually the margins of difference in those schools, um, you know, could be quite small um, in terms of, in terms of how that judgment has been reached and therefore the experience of those young people. And, you know, I'm not, I think sometimes we think of special measure schools and we think of schools that are in chaos and, you know, and, and that may be the case in some circumstances, but often it's not, mm -hmm. you know, often it's about, you know, a special measure school can be a community that is doing the absolute best it can in very, very challenging circumstances. Actually, what we should be doing is looking at how we can support that school to make the journey that it's on. Absolutely. But because we have this sort of short termism in the system, it never gets the chance to happen. You know, there's a school just down the road from me that I think is on its 12th head teacher in a decade um, because none of those heads have been given the time or the space or the support, the proper sort of regional strategic support mm -hmm. to make the difference that is required for that community to be successful. So we just keep making the same mistakes over and over again. We take this, I wrote a piece a couple, probably a couple of years ago now, 18 months ago, you know, the sort of the bonfire of the head teachers. You know, this one's, you know, you've, you've come, you've got a great track record. That's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, come and lead our school. Yeah, brilliant, fantastic. Come and lead our school. Oh, you didn't change it in six months. Right, let's get rid of you and let's get another one. You're crap now. Let's find somebody who can do it. 
You know, we've got this really sort of simplistic view for sort of rapid transformation of our school environments. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that we're looking to challenge and go, we know it's a nonsense. You know, of, of those 12 head teachers who have worked and led in that school, each of them has got a previous narrative and a previous reputation that has been damaged by the fact that they've gone into those schools. Um, you know, and, and it's that notion of we're creating these school communities that nobody wants to go to. Parents don't want to send their children there, but they have to. Staff don't want to go and work there. Leaders don't want to work there because the risk to their reputation and the risk to their career is so great. And it's an absolute nonsense. We need to flip it on its head and we need to think about those communities differently. And we need to be much more strategically connected about the change that we want to see in those communities. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, that requires that requires Oster to take context into account and they never will. You know, so they'll never take context into account because then they can't, you know, their perception is they then can't have a fair um, accountability system. You know, it can't be judged fairly across the board. But, you know, th these are complex issues and we're trying to deal with them with really blunt tools. Yeah. And it's what we what we need in that school is, is a leader who's passionate about that school, passionate about education, passionate about that community and, and, and is given the time to make the change, the cultural change that's required to enable that community and the children in it and the families in it to feel successful in a way that perhaps they've not been enabled to do before. And I think, you know, that's, that, I don't think that's too difficult to achieve, but it needs a, it needs a step change in thinking around the way in which we judge our schools and the way in which we judge the work that our schools do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I completely, your, your counter was absolutely bang on. And, and to be fair, like the reason why I kind of pointed that out is because I think what, one of the, I mean, the, the biggest issue is when you've got a special measure school and you've got a school that's outstanding down the road from each other and you're absolutely right. I mean, like, how is this judged? Right. But the problem is it doesn't it still affects the public perception. So whether it's a teacher looking for a job, I mean, they're not going to they would rather go work in the outstanding school. I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's harder. I mean, you get the, the teachers with grit that would actually want to make an improvement to schools and that's fine. But there's less of them. You know, yeah. then then you've got to try to keep the parents on board. I mean, th there's parents that will drive 15 miles in London to take them to an outstanding school instead of their local school. I mean, that's a problem yeah. with itself. You know? Yeah, compl I, I, com I completely agree with you. You know, and I, I live in an area where that that is incredibly amplified and very very exaggerated. Um, so you know, I, I completely agree. What but what we need to do? You know, one of the things that you know, sickens me to the core is that we describe schools that are not perceived to be delivering the same quality as other schools. We, we decide that we're gonna reduce our description of that school down to two words, special measures. Yeah. So we're taking, we're taking the work of the entirety of that community. So, you know, if it's, a, if it's an average size secondary school, a thousand children, you know, a hundred staff, probably more, probably 120, 130 staff, all and with and the, and the community more broadly, so the parents who are in that community as well. And we are saying that everything that happens in that school is special measures. It's when you when you look at it like that, it is clearly and patently an absolute nonsense that we do that. And actually, if, and it doesn't take much to change it. And I think that the fear is that somehow we will lose the level of challenge. We will, you know, it, it'll be soft if we change it or anything else. But it doesn't have to be. You know, appreciative inquiry is actually really, really challenging. Why do we need, why do we need a four point scale to judge our schools? I don't, I don't I, I've yet to see an argument that stands up to any significant scrutiny. So, so essentially you could, basically schools are either good enough or they're improving. Yeah. And they're improving towards it. So why, why do we not just describe our schools like that? So this is a good school. This school is improving. Mm. Um, and this is the things that th these are the things that this school needs to do to improve further. These are the things that this good school over here needs to do to improve further. So we need to we need to change this kind of snapshot in time, um, blunt instrument measure of what our schools are doing. Absolutely. And then we can do what you're describing, which we can start to change the perception of the people in the community, because ultimately, we've, we, you know, we've ended up with this. Um, We've ended up with a sort of society, this notion of choice for our parents about which school their children go to. For some, it's not a choice at all. So again, we've got an equity issue. 
because for some, well, you just send your school, your children to the local school. There is no choice. That's where they have to go. And yet for other areas, you talk about, you know, metropolitan London, but probably some of the other big metropolitan areas in the country where actually parents will genuinely have choice. And then they will cheat. Of course they will. You know, if you presented it to to, to any parent in the country, okay, we've got this school, which we're describing as special measures. And this one we're describing as outstanding. Which would you like your child to go to? Of course, you are going to take it at the surface level at which it's presented and you're going to send your child to the outstanding one. Does yeah. that help that school down the road? No, it doesn't. Yeah. Does it help it to solve the issues that it's facing? No, it doesn't. So we keep these schools in this perpetual cycle that, they, that are very, very difficult to get out of. Um, and, and it's all for a grading system. That Now, the biggest irony of the whole lot, you know, and I, and I, I very much, you know, was at the, at the core of this at my school, the biggest irony of the whole thing is actually what Ofsted are actually looking at, the detail and the granularity of what they're looking at when they go in and look at a school is actually different to what parents look for when they want to send their child to the school. Um, so, so, but what the parents end up using to judge whether they're going to send their child there or not, they use this. So, so we've got this sort of oppositional, you know, most parents, you talk to most parents, what do you want for your child at school? I want them to be happy. I want them to be safe. And I want them to enjoy their learning. That's not what Ofsted necessarily are looking for in the framework. Um, and certainly when they were using performance tables all of the time to make their judgment criteria, that absolutely wasn't what they were looking for. Um, you know, so I think, again, this is sort of irony in the system that what parent, the, the, the information that we're giving to parents to enable them to make a choice isn't actually truly representative of that school community in the first place. Um, so, yeah, we've just got to stop all of that. Yeah. So it's unnecessary. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we, we kind of need to make sure that we're actually working on the communities and, and not just kind of like, I think the competition is, is, is got, has got to go. I mean, it, for far too long, this high stakes accountability and league tables and the way that Ofsted comes in as a judge opposed to a supportive friend has, has, has just created this big rift. You know, it's almost like, and, and I'm like, not trying to be a conspiracy theorist, but it's almost like the government want to divide and conquer. You know, and it's like we, we need to kind of collaborate and actually fight against that and actually think, you know what, what's going to actually help improve education as a whole? Yeah, exactly. As I said, the department for education rather than department against it. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure you are not the only one. And, and I'm saying that because I know I've had exactly the same thought, you know, that this this sort of notion of fragmentation across our education system. Um, you know, I don't necessarily think that's accidental. Um, you know, but, you know, that, again, is a slightly different issue, and we're well past that now, um, you know, but the, we still got people arguing about academies and, and, and local authority schools. It's kind of like, you know, that's very much the what. You know, we're stuck in this argument about the what. Actually, let's get back down to the fundamentals of why and how. What, we're trying, what is education for? What do we want to do with it? Why do we do it? And how are we going to go about doing it? So, you know, because that we can coalesce around. We've not, you know, most people, you, you, most people who work in education are going to say what you said earlier on, you know, which is basically you want the best for the young people who come for your school. Um, you know, that's 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 a much healthier thing that we can we can congregate around, and then we can seize the agenda back in the way that you're de- describing. Absolutely. I mean, it's really powerful stuff there, James. I mean, it's exactly why I wanted to get you on and obviously share those thoughts, because I think ultimately we, we need to come together. And it, it's about time that we, we, we do. And I think you're doing some amazing stuff. So like I said, I'll keep I'll keep sending head teachers your way if I feel like they're, they're aligned to your views. But um, I think most. Yeah, are. Well, well, please do. And, and, you know, if I could have the opportunity at the end, just to give a, you know, a big a big shout out for the Heads Up Network um, and to encourage, you know, um please do go and check out the website so yeah, every everything we do we pretty much offer for free um you know so if you're a head teacher and you, you are if you are struggling with and and by god it would be no wonder if you were you know the anxiety and the pressure and stress of the current situation then please do give us a call please do not um you know sort of try and manage that yourself um we've got a network of people who are happy to connect with you and support you if you want to take that beyond a one-to-one conversation, that's absolutely fine. Please do come and join our support sessions. They are incredibly positive and very, very uplifting um, and, and, you know, just just fabulous places to be. And if you want to get involved in some of the stuff that we've been talking about, you know, the more sort of 
transformative change end of the discussion, then please do join us on our Wednesday our Wednesday night sessions um, uh, and come and throw your voice. You know, head teachers, well, all people who work in education, but head teachers as the leaders of their community, you know, they are the agents for change in our system. You know, and if we can get head teachers to to join spaces where they're actually involved in this conversation, I think a lot of the problem is quite often that they're, they're sidelined. They're not even involved in the conversation in the first place, or they're relying on representatives to have it for them. My encouragement to all head teachers is get make sure your voice is heard and make sure that your opinion about the way that you think education should be is heard. And you know, we won't always agree on everything. I'm absolutely sure, but you will always find a um, you know a welcome at the Heads Up Network. Um, so uh, I would put that shout out for for head teachers across the land and and you know people in education more broadly. By God, I take my hats off to every single one of you. I just think, you know, it's a it's a tough job at the best of times, and it's definitely not the best of times at the moment. So, um, you know, you get you if you're not hearing thanks from anybody else, you get a massive thank you from me. So, um, well done to everybody. Yeah, absolutely, and, and thanks for me. But also, just to kind of reiterate and back up uh, what James just said. I mean, I went to the meeting a couple of Wednesdays ago, and I thought it was brilliant. I mean, it's not like it's our way or the highway at all. Like, it's very, very collaborative, and um, they kind of. I mean, Alice and Creel and Colin Goffin both actually kind of shared their experiences, and it was up to people to kind of talk about it in the chat and actually kind of collaborate and go back and forth and agree and ask questions. And it's all about collaborating and actually improving education as a whole. Um, I mean, it's fantastic. So, yeah, I mean, if you guys are actually thinking about kind of changes you want to make, I mean, definitely give give James a shout or heads up for head teachers a shout because I, I think they're doing amazing stuff. So, yeah, hopefully we can get more people on board. Brilliant. Thanks for coming on and thanks everyone for watching as usual. Brilliant. Thanks, TJ.